Hello viewers, welcome to our live program of CIT NCRT on Swayam Prabha channel. I am Sabila Rashid and today we are going to talk about how to design a session plan. We have Dr. K. V. Shri Devi with us who is associated with RMSA project cell of NCERT. Ma'am, we welcome to our show. Good morning, Sabila. Good morning, viewers. Uh, today we are going to have, as uh, Sabila said, how we are going to learn or understand how to design a session plan. Uh, before that, uh, Sabila, I would like to share some experiences of mine uh, uh, regarding, uh, uh, you know, uh, our training sessions at RMSA Project Cell. As I think all of us know that RMSA uh, Project Cell had been conducting lot of training programs uh, since its inception. Hmm. And during the training programs, what I found was, Sabila, we when, uh, the, when I interacted with the teachers at all, I found that they were good at content right. and they were having a pedagogical knowledge also. But uh, somewhere something was going wrong uh, which was not uh, shown uh, in the results. Hmm. I mean, whatever the knowledge, the pedagogical knowledge, whether it is content knowledge, they are not integrated properly when they were delivering the lesson. Right. Not only that, last year we happened to uh, go to various uh, secondary school classrooms uh, and interacted with various teachers. And even during that time, hmm. what we found is the same issue we have uh, seen. So, I was just thinking uh, when I was analyzing the situations, the context, I felt that there is something wrong in the planning stage. Right. Probably one has to understand how to design a session, how to prepare themselves both content wise, pedagogy, assessment, resources, everything that is required to make an effective lesson in the class. So, right, planning is very important while delivering a lecture. Yeah, yeah, it is very, very most essential step. Right. If you are planning well, then probably you will be getting the expected result at the end. Hmm. Hence, such designing a session plan becomes very essential for any session, right. whether it is for teaching students, whether it is for taking training uh, sessions for the adults, hmm. whomever it is, whatever may be the audience. But designing a session plan is the most important uh, step of, uh, you know, training part or teaching part. So, today we will start with like how we have to design a lesson plan. Hmm. Like, let us uh, go with the four important questions. Right. First one is whom to teach, why to teach, what to teach and how to teach. Right. Oh, Sabila, tomorrow if you have to take a session, hmm. what is the first thing which comes to your mind? Like whom to teach. Whom to teach. Right. The target. Yeah, audience. target group. Like, uh, why do you think of it? Because accordingly, I have to prepare the content and then. Yeah, then wonderful, it. wonderful. That is what we are also intending here. Whom to teach is something very important factor where you, because if the, if you, the audience is elementary school children, then you have different strategies. Right. If your audience are secondary school uh, children, it is different. If they are adults, still all the more it is different. Right. There is a pedagogy and andragogy. Pedagogy is nothing but the science of teaching children. Hmm. Andragogy is science of handling adults. So, you have different methodologies and strategies that you need to employ depending upon the audience to whom you are, uh, you know, catering to. So, that is what is whom to teach. Uh, let us just go a little in detail about it. Hmm. Now, when I say audience, here what I mean to say is understanding the learner, understanding the participant, who is going to participate in your session, like what is their existing knowledge, what do they know about the concept that you are going to deal with. You have to know what they understand about it, so that you can try to help them in constructing the knowledge in that particular perspective. Right. Not only that, like every teacher has got a teaching style, hmm. in the same way every learner has got a learning style. Sabila, I love to watch something and learn. How about you? I love to read and you then love understand. to read. One of my friends loves to do and learn. Right. See, I am a visual learner, you are an oral learner and she is a kinesthetic learner. So, all of us are having different learning styles and we all belong to different backgrounds also, right? right. Like each of one of us different, uh, belong to different socio-economic status. At the same time, our needs are different. And that changes the perspective we look at yeah, particular yeah, things. That's and what, that is why we need to understand the learner, uh, his uh, existing knowledge, interest, learning style, background, needs, you know, aptitudes, everything. 
we need to analyze the learner rather. So, Dr. Sridevi, you have already mentioned that different learners have different way of understanding at a particular thing. Yeah. So, how should the teacher uh, address the classroom? Yeah, that we will be uh, seeing in the next, uh, you know, coming right. uh, components. Now, apart from that, context becomes very important. What will be the class size? How many participants are going to be with us? Hmm. Accordingly, the modality also will change. Don't you think, Sabila, if we have only two people in front of us, uh, we have a different mode of interacting with them. Yeah. If we have 10 people in front of us, we have a different mode of interacting mm -hmm. with them. So, class size becomes important. You need to perceive the class size and then design the strategies which are very essential for you to take up. So, this is what I am trying to say, I mean trying to put across that is whom to teach and what is the context in which you are teaching. Next thing is, for uh, all of us, we know that unless and until it is necessary and important to us, we do not want to learn. Do you agree with me? Right. Right. So, why to teach becomes very important. Why am I teaching? What do I expect from students at the end of the session? I need to have that focus. I need to have certain, uh, frame certain objectives, uh, like whether I want my students to acquire factual knowledge whether I want my students to develop understanding of some phenomenon or a process or concepts or whether I want my children to analyze something or develop certain analytical skills among them. And apart from that, every student, if he wants to become an independent learner, he has to develop certain skills in him, which we call them as processes. So, we need to have some goals in front of us, some objectives in front of us. Once the, we have framed the objectives, accordingly the content will be taken into perspective. Once the content is different from different objectives, hmm. then the goals also change. Hmm. When the goals change, then surely there should be change in the nature of teaching. If I want my students to get acquire some factual knowledge, then the method in which I am going to teach will be different. If I want my students to analyze, then the method is different. So, how it is, we will try to understand further. Next is what to teach. That is what I was speaking about. Like, what do you, what are we going to teach? In general, a layman's language, if I have to say, it is subject matter. Right. Now, what is subject matter? Otherwise, we call it as content. Now, what is content? Content is nothing but the knowledge that results from processing of information. Now, let me just give you an example. Uh, Right. When I ask, how is my sari today? It's pretty. Pretty. What do Colourful. You, how did you say that? Uh, maybe the color combination. Yeah, you observed. Yes. Your sensory organ eyes helped you in identifying the color and then you just said that it is beautiful. You have given with expression. So, the knowledge which we get just from the sensory organs, that is nothing but information. Right? This information when it is processed, it becomes knowledge. So, lot of information we collect in our daily life. Hmm. We see and uh, collect, we listen, we do. With our sensory organs, we accumulate lot of information. And our brain is such a wonderful processor that it processes to make it, convert it into knowledge. Hence, every type of knowledge be, uh, is dependent upon the, the way it is processed. Right. That is the reason we need to understand what are we going to teach. What is the content, uh, I mean what type of knowledge is there in the selected content? We need to analyze that and that activity is called as content analysis. So, this is the responsibility of the teacher beforehand to prepare the yeah, content yeah, analysis. Yeah, that is true, that is correct. So, how to, why we need to do the content analysis, probably we will try to throw light on that. The first and foremost thing, I am going to teach something. Hmm. So, I need to understand the nature and scope of the content. Right. What am I going to teach? What type of content is it? Is it descriptive? Is it exploratory? Is it explanatory? Is it illustrative or is it procedural? Like, am I, like being a biology teacher, hmm. I would like to describe the structure of heart hmm. or structure of a flower or structure of a, you know, uh, a cockroach. Now, I need to describe cockroach. See, biology is a subject which develops aesthetic sense among the students. Right. So, it is not just teaching something. It is developing aesthetic sense along with the knowledge part. So, what type of content is there with you? 
what type of knowledge is inbuilt into that content that you need to understand and the scope of it also. Do I have scope of integrating technology in it? Do I have scope of integrating you know various assessment formats into it? That I need to understand. Dr. Shridevi, we will continue with the discussion further. Uh, we would like to inform that we are continuously live streaming on Swayam Prabha channel, channel number 31 as well as we are streaming on YouTube channel as well on NCRT official and we have some viewers with us, who, one of the viewers has asked this question that how to frame a goal or aim of a particular session. Yeah. See, the probably any session, surely we would have had some com content in mind. Again, let us understand one thing, without content we cannot, uh, you know, uh, go for any uh, objective for that particular session. Mm -hmm. We may have broader objectives or expectations of the curriculum that we can keep in mind mm -hmm. and then we can think of setting objectives for that particular session. For example, just now as I told, uh, developing aesthetic sense or scientific attitude among the students, mm -hmm. that is a very broad, broad objective which we have in front of us whether it is uh, elementary stage or secondary stage or any stage for that matter. But in the session what are we looking at? So the goals which we are going to set will become very specific, specific to that 45 minutes or one hour uh, you know we are catering to. Mm. And the content, with respect to content we will be setting a goal. So for example, maybe in this session, uh, if I take a session for 45 minutes teaching photosynthesis, hmm. then I will be setting a goal that okay, my students at the end of the session should understand the process of photosynthesis. So like goals should be prepared beforehand. Yeah, yeah, you have, they are the expected learning outcomes by the end of the session. So you need to keep in mind the content, you need to keep in mind the time, you hmm. need to keep in mind the context and then set the goal. So setting goal is one of the f prime responsibility of a teacher before she enters the classroom. Rather we should say that is the first stage of planning a lesson. Okay, right. I hope you yes. got the answer. Yes. Fun. Wonderful. Okay, let us continue with that. So I was telling that we need to understand the nature and hmm. scope of the content. Hmm. After that, we need to understand technically to say Anderson in, nine, uh, in 60s, he had come out with different types of knowledge. He says that knowledge can be categorized into four categories, mm. namely factual knowledge, conceptual knowledge, procedural knowledge and metacognition. Factual knowledge as the term says, you know, facts mm. and conceptual knowledge you have different categories. We will discuss them in detail one after the right. other. Let us just go with the uh, types of knowledge. Mm. As I just now told, factual knowledge deals with facts, mm. conceptual knowledge deals with all other categories of uh, you know, knowledge like concepts, principles, laws, theories, generalizations, axioms, postulates and so on and so forth. These are all different products of, uh, you know, the information processing that happens in our mind. Now we have something called as procedural knowledge. Most of the time we neglect this. Unfortunately, uh, we neglect this part. What does it include? It includes practical skills, mm. you know, different techniques like in uh, how to handle a microscope, lot of techniques are involved in it. Mm. Then when you are doing a titration, how are you going to do it? How are you going to set the burette? How are you going to use the bu uh, pipette? How are you going to record? Mm. That is nothing but practical skills. So uh, we need to give scope for such skills also in our sessions. So like different type of knowledge requires different type of planning and uh, uh, the teacher should uh, like have this knowledge that how he sh should conduct the classroom? Yeah, yeah, of course. So I will just uh, add a few more things and then get back to your question. Here, uh, apart from that, what other processes are included? Now uh, we have listed out different types of knowledge. Apart from that, or to reach those uh, knowledge, we need to have or we need to promote certain skills among the students. The basics of the basics is observing. We learn a lot through observation. Many things in our life we learn through observation. Probably I, we have learnt even the basic skills. A child learns how to start a kick up, start a vehicle when he observes his father doing it. Like in the same way, uh, girls learn, you know, uh, cycling the way other friends have cycled. Many things we learn through observing. It's not only observing. We learn it through classifying, we measuring, inferring, predicting, communicating. All these skills are called as basic skills or we can even specifically call them as science, 
process skills, these are all cognitive skills. And then we have integrated skills also, wherein defining operationally, any term we give, we have to define operationally. And then we have to control variables, we have to hypothesize, we have to experiment, all these are called as integrated skills. Apart from these processes, in, apart from these skills, we have attitudes, interests, values that need to be developed in our sessions. So, a session should go in a holistic way. It is not just content which is more important. Along with the content, we need to develop certain processes among the students, irrespective of the level of students, level of audience. They may be students, they may be teachers, they may be, you know, anybody for that matter. So, it should go in a holistic manner. Now, coming to your question, each category of knowledge or type of knowledge, uh, first we need to understand what they are and how they are formed or formulated or learned. Then we can think of design, deciding the method in which they can be taught or they can be learned. Now, coming to the facts and generalization, Sabina, most of the time people get confused of these two terms or rather they use synonymously, very right. casually they use. Let us try to understand how these terms are different. Now, when we go for fact, fact is nothing but a singular occurrence. Just now you told, how is this when I say, what is the color of this spectacles? Black. Black in color. Hmm. How did you say? You just saw it hmm. and then immediately you responded to me. Hmm. So, it is a singular occurrence. Hmm. Hmm. The same way, it is directly from the sensory experience. That is what I mean to say. Right. Apart from that, Right now, it is existing, so you have told. Hmm. If I ask you, uh, how was the weather yesterday? It was raining. It was raining. This is a past experience. Hmm. So, facts can be, uh, you know, from the past or they may be existing in the present. Hence, they do not have predictive validity. You cannot predict things for tomorrow and day after tomorrow. Whereas, when we see generalization, they result from large amounts of data. That means, many observations you will make and from so many observations, you will call out the result from the inference that you have drawn from those observations. That means, you observe many times, then you uh, draw an inference and then from the inference, you will draw a generalization. That means, so, it depends on one person to draw general information? Yeah, anybody for that matter, okay. but you should have make many observations. Okay. You cannot draw an inference with one observation. You have to make many observations, draw an inference and then come out with a result and that result is nothing but a formulated generalization. Okay. Like when you uh, see that, um, uh, you know, you have different type of plants in your environment. Hmm. You have seen one croton plant which is green in color. You say that this is green in color, so it is, it might be able to synthesize you know, food on its own. Hmm. You see a creeper which is green in color and you say that it is able to trap sunlight and it is green in color. So, it might be able to synthesize food. You might see a big tree which has green leaves and then you say that they are all green in color and they are growing. So, hmm. it is photosynthetic in nature. Then, what is the generalization that you can frame? That the green uh, objects or green plants have photosynthesis. Yeah, most of the green plants yeah. which are able to trap sunlight are photosynthetic in nature. Hmm. As they are photosynthetic in nature, they are able to produce food. Hmm. So, this is the generalization which you have drawn from many instances, right. not from single instance. So, that is the difference between a fact and a generalization. Let me just give you some more examples for that. Hmm. Now, these are the left side you can see facts. Right now, you are listening to me, Savila, right? Right. Even that is a fact. Yes. Right. Even cell was first discovered by Robert Hooke in 1665. This is a past event, hmm. but it is a fact. Hydrogen has one electron. It is a fact. Now, let us see the examples for generalization. Each living cell has a capacity to perform certain basic functions that are characteristic feature of all living organisms. Now, basic function when I say respiring, you know, nutrition, all these things. Every cell is performing all these functions. How do we come to know? Hmm. Observing many cells. Different type of cells we have observed and we have come to a generalization that every living cell can, has a capacity to perform basic functions that are very much required for the living organisms. Right. In the same way, different kinds of cells perform different functions. A cell which you find in digestive system hmm. has got a different function. Hmm. 
A cell which you find in respiratory system has got a different function. A cell which is there, neuron, for example, a nerve cell, it has got different function. That means different cells perform different, different functions. functions. In the same way, every atom has charged particle, irrespective of the atom of any element, hmm. every atom has got charged particles. So, these are all generalizations which are formulated after n number of observations. Right. That is why generalizations have predictive ability. That means, they, ha they are having the capability to predict things. So, right. this is how facts and generalizations are different. Are different. Hmm. So, we will proceed to the next one, very important one concept. Uh, concepts are something very interesting, I tell you. Again, when we have to define a concept, how do we define? Let us take an example. Uh, how do you, uh, you know, uh, if I give lot of objects to you in front of you hmm. and I ask you to identify a flower, how do you identify? Um, maybe it is colorful okay. and uh, it has petals okay. and uh, I don't know. <laughs> Just imagine you have pencil, rubber, pen, sketch pen, mm. spectacles, books, everything in front of you and the flower is there in between. Mm. Do you recognize the flower? Yes, I you, do. You visually, I mean visually I can. Huh, you identify a flower. Yes. Let us assume a rose is there in front of mm. you. You identify. Yes. How did you identify? Uh, maybe because of a lot of times I have seen rose how it looks like yeah. and then. And then? And then it is. Yeah. Uh, and then it has petals and stem. Okay, wonderful. So, you try to see some characteristic features in that object and you try to associate with various flowers and then come to a conclusion saying that that is a flower. Yes. So, concepts are identified based upon certain characteristic features, right. Hmm. So, concepts are nothing but they are the form of content or a type of content or knowledge that results from summarizing and abstracting of facts. What it is, let me just tell you. Now, uh, when we uh, ask, when we uh, see every human being, we are born curious. Do you agree with me? Yes. All of us, when we move around, we try to see the objects around us. Mm -hmm. And when we see the objects around us, we have, we, it is an innate uh, nature of an individual to see some common features and to see some differences. Based on the differences and uh, you know what we do is we try to categorize things like for example, living things, non-living things or we, when we go to a fruit mandi or uh, vegetable market, we will see that these are fruits, these are vegetables, these are something else. Mm. So, this is nothing but classifying. How do we classify? We classify based on the common characteristic features. See, concepts are formed by summarizing those characteristic features which are common or similar to a group of things. So, what we do? First, we try to identify the characteristic features. Then, based on common characteristic features, we group them mm. and then that group, we try to give a name to that group. That generalized idea is called as a concept. Like lily, rose, sunflower, all these are called yeah. as Flowers. Hmm. Flower is the name of the concept and all these are examples of that concept flower. So, uh, concepts are basically formed after summarizing and abstracting, summarizing and abstracting of facts. Again, facts are made because of observation. Right. That means, even for concept, what is the basic skill? Observing. Right. Right. And here, every individual, all of us, we have natural, uh, you know, uh, ability of uh, differentiating things, grouping things mm. and then uh, labeling things. Mm. And then they, we form a concept. Now, do you understand that the forming of concepts or formulation of concepts or developing concepts is different from acquiring factual knowledge, is not it? Right. Right. Here are examples when we say, I told you about flower, we have a lot of examples we can take, cell, microscope, multicellular organisms, you know, photosynthesis, exothermic reactions, reflection, refraction, all these are concepts. These are all generalized idea which are made out of many observations based on certain common characteristic features. Now, uh, coming to laws, coming to laws. Uh, uh, now, have you heard of any laws? 
in your yes, high school Newton's days, law. Newton's law, you mm. have heard, Mendelian's law, law mm. of dominance, law of segregation, all these things, mm. right. Now, how are these laws formed? These laws are nothing but again based on observations. Scientists, they have observed mm. and they have described the phenomenon. I hope you understand the difference between description and explanation. A uh, description is something I get to describe. Yeah, yeah. For one, yeah, you are on the right track. Description involves describing the structure, appearance, hmm. size, shape, and uh, how it is happening. I mean, what is the structure? How it looks like, and all that. Explanation is going for reasoning. You know, explaining the process and all such things. Laws are descriptive in nature. That is an interesting feature of a law. They are descriptions of phenomena. They are proven observations. They are not right. simply observed once and uh, you know formulated. Hmm. So uh, all these examples which we have listed out, Mendel's law of inheritance, hmm. law of dominance when we say, what is law of dominance? Law of dominance where we find that the dominant character is always expressed. Mendel tried to prove it. So it is a law. It is described. In the same way Newton's law of gravitation, it is described. So laws are descriptive, descriptive in, nature. in nature. Now, when we come into theories, theories are, theories are, you know, they are the attempts to explain a phenomenon. Hmm. They are not just descriptions. They are explained. Reason. They are reasoned out. They are, exp, uh, you know, the process is explained. They are repeatedly tested, observed, and experimented. Hmm. Okay, like cell theory. If you take, I think you would have heard. All living organisms are made up of cells, we say, and these cells exist from the pre-existing cells, we say. These are two statements which are observed n number of times and the theory is proposed by Schleden and Squan. He says that all living organisms are made up of cells, irrespective of what type of organism it is. And how are these cells existing? They are existing from the pre-existing cells. That means two generalization, two principles are there and these two are related together to form a theory. So theories are explanative in nature. They explain the phenomenon that is occurring in nature and they are very well tested, observed and experimented. Now coming to, now uh, let me ask uh, one thing. Hi. Now I hope you understood that there are lot of, uh, there are different types of knowledge. Hmm. You understood that there are facts, concepts, theories, laws, apart from that we have assumptions, mm. we have axioms, we have principles, we have postulates, so many different types of knowledge are available. Now if without knowing how to handle these things, if you teach what will happen? Do you think the teacher will be able to do justice? No. Do you think children will learn properly? No. No. So, so this is one issue which I wanted to raise in front of the, uh, you know, uh, the audience here. Hmm. We need to teach, hmm. uh, we need to understand the nature of knowledge and then go for deciding the method of teaching. Right. If we are not following this step, then probably the objective which we have kept bef in the session, in the initial uh, discussion hmm. will not be met, will not be able to reach the children, the children will not be able to understand things better. So it is very important for the teacher to understand the differences of these kind yeah. of knowledge and then implement it into the classroom. Yeah, that is what I just wanted to say that understanding the nature of subject is something very, very important, nature of discipline. Like for example, science, science is a dynamic subject. Yeah. It has to be dealt in a different way. We cannot just go by lecture method. Hmm. We have to think of giving, providing lot of opportunities for children to hmm. experience. Right. Now, uh, let us quickly go for how to teach in this. Here we need to understand one thing that there is no single approach appropriate in all situations hmm. and we need to see that all the resources are kept with us hmm. and most important thing is provide opportunities for children to collaborate, communicate and demonstrate their creativity with various non-traditional methods. Non-traditional I would like to say, hmm. let us try to help the children in expressing their ideas through posters, through pictures, through mimes, through drama, you know all, all sort of non-traditional hmm. Methods. There should be creativity in the classroom so yeah. that the student can understand better. Understand and express better right. and appropriate assessment strategies have to be uh, selected based on the nature of knowledge that we have 
understood. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Shudevi, for being on our show and letting our viewers understand that how should he or she plan a session. This is all for today. If you have any suggestion or any query, you can call us on our toll-free number as well as you can mail us on the email provided. Uh, this is all for today. Tomorrow, we will come up with another topic, another expert. Thank you so much for being with us. See you tomorrow. Thanks a lot.